Jesus' name. Amen. In the, uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, behavior, so I know you'll be really glad you came tonight. But uh, in 1 Peter, the second chapter, uh, in verse 1, it said, So get rid of all evil behavior. I'm, I'm going to just go ahead and tell you what I'm headed down. I'm going to talk about behavior. I'm going to talk about how we deal with persecution and, uh, and how to handle things like that. Because did you know the devil knows what it takes to shake you? And so he's been watching you your whole life, and so he knows exactly what agitates you, and he's going to send people along to do that. But God gives us some instruction on how we ought to behave. He says, so get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit and hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babes, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you'll grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temper. What's more, you are holy, his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. And as the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. And yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those that reject him, let me get back to this. Those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes all people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you're not like that. This is a great thing. I love this where it says, but you're not like that. Uh, there are a whole lot of places in the Bible when people read it, and they automatically assume because they saw it in Scripture it applies to them. Now, I have a whole piece that I do when I'm teaching ministers training school where I teach people how to discern what this Bible says. Don't, don't ca call Old Testament things New Testament things. Don't call New Testament things Old Testament things. Don't talk about, don't, don't, because you read that uh, when you have a child who's misbehaving that you ought to bring before the elders and if they, he won't change, then stone him to death. We don't do that. I had a guy that was in therapy today and and uh, I was joking with him about how my mother, who is 92, still has a big old can of bacon grease and s puts bacon grease on everything that she cooks at the house. And here I am trying to eat a sprig of parsley, you know, and a stock of celery, and my mom's living forever. So I don't understand it all. And the minute he spoke up, so said, well, you need to tell her not to do that. She shouldn't eat pork. And so, uh, and I said, well, you know, that same group of scriptures said you shouldn't cut the corner of your beard. And I notice you have. And uh, do you like catfish? Yeah, I like catfish. Well, they said you shouldn't eat that. That's a scavenger. Shrimp is a scavenger. So is a lobster. And uh, I just want to tell you, I eat pork. I eat shrimp. I eat lobster. If it doesn't get away from me and I can catch it, I kill it and eat it. So anyway. But he said, you're not like that. So remember, we're different. We're different. When they try to, we still have people trying to apply Old Testament principles to our New Testament life. And if they've ever read Colossians, the Colossians are very clear about telling you, don't get caught up in all that stuff because Christ was completion of all that. Then he goes on, he said, but you're not like that. You're a chosen people. You're royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And this is one of the points we're make, going to make tonight is that we have been called out of the darkness and into the light and we have the ability with God's presence in us to be able to show the world what Jesus really looks like. Amen. He says, once you had no identity as a people, but now you're God's people. Did you know the Jews didn't recognize Gentiles as anything to spend any time with? It wasn't unusual to be called a dog or all kinds of names. They, you just didn't count. We count. 
At one time, we weren't considered a people, but now we are a people. We are in Christ. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very soul. Uh, I, started, I actually started to put a, uh, a uh, Facebook post on the other day, and then I raced it and decided not to. It'll just stir up too much trouble. But did you know the things that are mentioned in the Old Testament and mentioned in the New Testament, they're still sin. And we have been washed of sin, and we've been set free from the penalty of sin, and we're not under the law anymore, are we? And since we're not under the law, people say, well, then we're set free to do anything. Well, you're set free to do everything, but what are you set free to do? To serve God. So now, since it's said in the Old Testament that thou shalt not lie or bear false witness, does that mean now that I'm a new covenant believer, I ought to start lying? No, because he said, in, he said in, in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, he wrote the laws and commands on my mind and my heart. So I know what's right and wrong. And he said, but their sins and iniquities I will remember no longer. So we have this beautiful thing where we know what's right and wrong, but the penalty's already been paid for you and I. We've accepted Jesus as our Savior and our remedy. And we know what's right and wrong, and yet he doesn't hold our sins and iniquities against us. Are we glad about that? He said, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. This is, this is so important. Uh, I told people inside this church that I'm not against them having a drink. But if you go on Facebook and you're, in, you're having dinner with some of your friends and you hold up a, a, a liquor, then the people that we help in recovery, if they see that Facebook page, you may cause them to stumble. Amen? It's the same way when, when Paul was dealt with, well, what about the... Uh, uh, what about the meat that was offered to idols? Can we eat that? Well, and what did he say? Meat's meat. But if you have a, a, a brother who has what he called a weaker conscience, then don't eat it around him because you don't want to cause him to stumble. This is what he's talking about. Be careful to live properly among our unbelieving neighbors. Did you know even the fact that they have some wrong ideas about what Christians are supposed to do, even though that's true, if I know they have an idea about it, and I know it's not sin, but I do it and cause them to stumble, I've still sinned, haven't I? Right. Then, then even if, they, if, you, if you're acting properly, so then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your honorable behavior, and they'll give honor to God when he judges the world. And now we're going to Romans 12, 9 through 21 in the New Living Translation. It's more instruction on how to live in this world. He said, don't just pretend to love others. Man, it just, it always gets to me to see people that are just fake. I like people that are real. We had a couple come forward uh, uh, Sunday morning and, and uh, said, boy, we loved the sermon. I said, well, I'm glad that you, we love the worship. I said, well, I'm glad. But we love the fact that you just talk to people like you're real. Well, I said, pinch me. I am real. <laughs> Uh, really love them. Hate what is wrong, but hold tightly to what is good. These are not outdated instructions from God. They're good instructions. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Here's a great instruction. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. He didn't say, don't worry about it, because you'll never have any trouble. He said, guess what? You're going to go through trouble, but be patient. Um, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Uh, this is something that God used me to teach my wife over the years, because she wasn't raised around that. And when we first got together, we may not have a lot, but if I saw somebody had less and needed it, and I'd give it to them, she goes, you know, we could have uh, we could have used it. There's a blessing in what we're doing. And there always was. And I've told the story many times. I remember when somebody would give me a $100 bill, and uh, I was meeting with another minister that had a lot of wealth. He wanted to meet for breakfast. He said, I'll buy you breakfast. In the midst of breakfast, the Lord said, give him that $100 bill. That's before I knew the principle of you ought to sow in to good soil. 
He was good soil. And so I'm sitting there knowing he's got enough money to get anything, and I got this $100 bill. I wasn't worried about the $100 bill, but I was worried about the response when I got home and told Debbie I'd given that $100 bill. <laughs> so, uh, so we were just pretty much done with the meal. I was just holding on to it and holding on to it. And then I reached in my pocket, and, and I went out to shake his hand. I stuck it in his hand. I said, Lord told me to bless you with this. And so I blessed him, and he spoke a blessing on me and my finances. Help God's people. We've got God's people that are suffering everywhere. I had a call from a missionary and uh, wanted to know, is there any way we can help them? I said, yes. I know them. We sow into good soil, don't we? And so uh, I know they're good soil, so we'll sow into their ministry. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. I got some old friends still to this day that when something goes wrong, boy, they just said, I'll just run over there and I'll just, no, you won't. I told a guy the other day that was going through something, he said, I'm going to leave right now. I ain't going to go to men's meeting. Man, I'm so mad. I said, well, get over it. You need to be at men's meeting. Don't let your temper. I said, you're taking the bait. I remember one of the things I read in Bait of Satan. They tell the story about how the natives would uh, catch uh, monkeys because they'd eat monkeys. And I don't eat monkeys. I, I eat everything else, but I don't eat monkeys. But anyway, so they, what they do is they'd put the bait inside this cage thing, and when the, when the monkey grabs a hold of it, they try to pull it out because they have a fist. They can't get it back through the hole. And without having enough sense, they'll just screech and everything else trying to get it out of there until they come beat and kill that monkey. And you might think we're not that way. But no, Satan knows the bait to catch you, and you'll reach in there, and you'll grab a hold of that bait, and the enemy wants to destroy your life, and you won't let go of that bait for anything. You're holding on to it. What, what's the bait there? An offense, because offenses will come. Amen? But what you've got to learn to do is release that offense. Then you can pull your hand out and get on your way. Amen? Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. That's never been a problem with me because I am ordinary people. And don't, you think, and, and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil for more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with who? Everyone. Live in peace. This was a hard scripture for me when I first got saved because I loved fighting and scrapping and carrying on. And, and uh, then I found out I'm supposed to live in peace. Dear friends, never take revenge. That's exactly. He says, leave it to the righteous anger of God. The scriptures say, I'll take revenge. I'll pay them back, says the Lord. I had a friend. He got to know him around here for a long time. We just joked about it because anybody do something wrong, he said, I'll go blow, blow that place up. So then it got kind of a joke here. Somebody say, you know, I heard old so-and-so this happened. He said, well, just tell Lee. I was going to give you the name. He, just, he said, go tell him. He'll go blow the place up, which he never does that. But he always talked about, I'm going to go blow this place. Blow it. No. But he was always angry. And I said, did you know your anger is not hurting anybody but you? Anger's what a, what a tricky thing anger is. I had such anger for so many years, and when the Lord told me that other people are not the problem, but I am the problem. You get used to reacting the same way all the time. And so if you always react in anger, you have a tendency to keep doing that. At some point you got to say, I refuse to do that. I'm not taking the bait. I'm going to be known as somebody who loves the unlovely. I'm going to be known as somebody that doesn't return evil for evil. I'm going to return, when people do me evil, I'm going to love them, and I'm going to do good to them. Blows their ever-loving mind. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you 
but conquer evil by doing good. Now, this last group of scriptures I'm going to get has been completely misunderstood for so many years. I'm going to talk about Paul's thorn in the flesh because people tried to taste his eyesight, this and that, and everything else. In reality, it's not. If they study the scriptures, they can find out what it is. I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in, we in weakness. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, uh, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, kind of paraphrase what he said or, or expand upon it. In 12, 7, he, he actually was saying this. You won't be able to read along with the scripture. This is just words. But it said, Paul was saying, because of the phenomenal revelations I've received on, on account of the vast number of these revelations that God has entrusted in me and to hinder the highly visible progress I'm making in the Lord's cause, a special messenger has been sent from Satan to harass me with constant distractions and headaches. No doubt about it. Those whom Satan had stirred up against me want my head on a stake. Satan is using people. Somebody say people. Satan is using people to constantly buffet and distract me in an attempt to keep me from reaching a higher level of visibility and recognition and to sidetrack me from my preaching revelation. Paul's, Paul's thorn in the flesh was not sickness, not eyesight. That wasn't it. It was a messenger of Satan stirring up people to persecute him all the time. If you read the story about how he was left for dead and stoned and everything else and imprisoned and shipwrecked, it wasn't sickness, epilepsy, any other physical problem. It was the people who opposed and irritated him and continually caused him problems. And the devil used these again and again to keep Paul distracted, solving people's problems that he wouldn't be able to make any more significant personal gospel events. What about you? What about the thorns that you have? What about the thorns that are in your side? People that stir up against you, the devil is using to steal your joy, sidetrack your mission in life. How do you intend to react to this ongoing disturbance? Paul never allowed people to keep him fulfilling his divine call. And I'm going to tell you today, don't, don't allow people to stop you. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities, darkness, evil places. This is what we're, this is what we're wrestling against. You know why the devil's after you? When I tell you this, you're going to not believe it. But the devil's afraid of you. He's afraid of any believer standing on the blood of Christ, washed in the blood, filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible's very clear, when we accepted Christ, we became one with him. And if you remember, when Satan was cast out of heaven, it's because he wanted to be an equal or greater to than God, and then one of God's creation was brought in to be one with God. Oh, no, he, he hates us for that very reason. He's afraid of you. He's afraid of your gifts and your potential, your revelations. If that weren't the case, he wouldn't have to incite people to come against you. But that's exactly what he does. Maybe you've heard yourself praying this prayer in a moment of exasperation when you're dealing with people. God, I can't deal with all these people anymore. Please remove all the people from my life who will make me lose my peace and joy. I've heard pastors get up and preach, God, remove everybody from this church that doesn't agree with me. I do about half my church. People don't agree with me about everything I say, and I don't care about that. What I care about is they agree that Christ's blood washes of our sins. Amen? And there are some people that are always going to come against you no matter where you are. And, uh, uh, and if you're going to pray, I don't want to deal with them, then who are you going to minister to? There have always been people that, that didn't like me, which I can understand because I like me a lot. I like me so much I spend 24 hours a day with me. <laughs> as long as you live in this world, you're going to have challenges in relationships you have with people. You always will. That's just part of dealing with human beings. God knows very well what it's like to deal with his creation. 
The only way you can be free, be, be, be free of challenges with imperfect humans is to die prematurely and go to heaven. But as long as you're here, you're going to have to deal with difficult people. I think one of the things that are surprising for me as a pastor is when I hear people complain about things that are so obvious. They're very obvious. I remember the young preacher said, man, if I could be a pastor, everybody would like me. I said, not true. No matter what you do in life, not everybody's going to like you. I heard one preacher uh, talking about this one time. He said, I told one of my guys one time, he said, hey, even your grandma's the only one that likes you, son. <laughs> I said, man. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8, he prayed, Paul prayed, to be delivered a problem people on three different occasions. That was his thorn in the flesh. Everywhere I go, I'm persecuted. I'm beating everything. I'm trying to get the message of Christ out. And everywhere I go, the devil, the messenger of Satan, is stirring people up. The whole idea that it was eyesight. I asked this preacher one time, why did you say it's his eyesight? Because he wrote that letter that said, see with what big letters I've written this. Well, what the heck does that mean? Does that mean that that was his thorn in the flesh? Several other occasions they talk about the thorn, and the thorn is never a physical problem. If you're going to live here on planet Earth, part of that package includes living with people who are far from perfect. And I might remind you that we are those people. Amen? My spirit was made perfect, but nothing else. He wanted to be free. He said, for this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. The word besought in the Greek word is parakaleo. An intense word is derived from the Greek words para and kaleo. The word para means alongside. The word kaleo means to call or to beckon upon. When compounded together in the word parakaleo, the new word pictures one who comes alongside someone else as close as he can get and then begins to passionately call out, plead, beckon, and beg, and beseech that person to do something on his behalf. In using the, wor the word parakaleo in this verse, Paul lets us know that he had passionately asked God to answer this prayer. I'm being persecuted. There's a thorn in the flesh sent to disrupt me, to dis destroy me. And Paul had drawn near to God as he possibly could. And once he was in that close position, he earnestly pleaded with God, asking him to deliver us. The word depart that he used is the Greek word aphistomy, which means to depart or remove. As a, as a rule, it is used to refer to people rather than things. The use of this Greek word amplifies the fact that Paul was praying to be freed from problem people. He was literally saying, God, I don't want to deal with these people anymore. I earnestly ask you, please remove them from my life. When we say that, we're saying, Lord, remove the opportunity I have to make a difference in that person's life. I've made a difference in people's lives who are very, very difficult people. I still have people in my life that others will ask me, why are you still dealing with those people? They never change. I said, I still deal with them because... God still deals with me. And I don't give up on people. But here's why God can't fully answer this kind of prayer. Even if God removed this particular group of people that caused Paul such trouble, it wouldn't be long before another group of people showed up. As long as we live in this world, we'll have to deal with people who don't enjoy uh, the same things we do and who the devil tries to use to steal our joy and our peace. That's why the Lord told Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. The word sufficient is the word archaeo. It's an old Greek word that means to be sufficient, to be satisfactory, to give protection, power, and help. In later Greek, it denoted a man who possessed great financial means. This type of person was sufficiently endowed with huge resources that were more than enough for him to endeavor. He would be able to do whatever he wanted to. He was financially strong, financially sufficient. Precisely the word used when he told Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. 
It's the equivalent of the Lord saying this. It's like the Lord saying, my grace is more than enough to protect you, empower you, help you to deal with the problem, people you encounter in life. You will find that my grace is completely satisfactory in meeting your need and that it will make you sufficiently strong to deal with these situations. That's what he's saying. In the toughest times of my life, I know that God has told me, I'm going to get you through this. I'm going to get you through. And you're going to come out better than what you were when you headed into this problem. We forget that when God looks at us and our problem, we forget that he's an all-knowing God. He knew that we'd go through this. And that all-knowing God, when he looks at life for us, it goes by second by second, year by year. But for God, it's a snapshot because he lives outside of time and space. It's a snapshot. Let me say it a different way. Creation is happening to him. The creation of this world is happening to him right now. And living in heaven with us for eternity is happening with him right now. And everything in between is happening with him right now. He lives outside of time and space. So in your problem, you may not be able to figure the ending of it, but God already knows the ending of it. The word strength, my strength is made perfect in weakness. I don't always explain this stuff, but the word strength in this verse comes from the Greek word dunamis, the, the word for dynamic power. This is a strength that always releases sufficient power and possesses the ability to make needed changes. So we start out tonight talking about this is how we ought to live in this world. And then I went immediately into the fact that, that while you're living in this world, doing everything you can, the reason he had to give you instruction on how to do good to people that are treating you evil because he knows that's when you look like Jesus. Then he moves right in to this story of Paul. God knew that Paul needed a new surge of divine power that would change his perspective and power him to successfully. He didn't have the right perspective when he was crying out to God, release me from this persecution. That shouldn't have been his prayer. So God answered him with, my strength is made perfect in weakness. The word weakness in the, in the Greek word is asthenio which means, describes a person who feels weak, distressed, unsettled, or needy. If Paul was referring to physical sickness, as some say, he would have used the word asthenus, which actually describes physical ailments. Two different words. He wasn't talking about physical ailments. He's talking about he felt weak with all the persecution that he went through. Because Paul used the word asthenio and not asthenus, it confirmed again, he's not talking about physical sickness. The Lord knew that Paul felt sufficient in his own strength to successfully, I mean insufficient in his own strength to deal with this. If Paul would open his heart to the Lord, God's promise that his strength would be made perfect in weakness. The word perfect is the word teleo, which means perfection, completion, something. I'm telling you, God is all powerful. He comes to meet our needs. We don't pray the wrong, the right way sometimes. God knows our heart. That's a good thing. But sometimes we're praying in ways that Paul did. Take this problem away when we should be praying, God, I give you this problem, and I trust in your strength to bring me through this. Amen? That verse could have been translated, my power is constantly being perfected in you wherever you feel weak and needy. My grace is more than enough, for if you'll receive it, you'll find you will sufficiently endow you with more than you need to deal with any situation. My power is always on hand, available to help you in moments when you're weak and needy. No, it's been about six years since I preached this sermon, but I'm glad I preached it. Evidently, it spoke to somebody tonight, or I wouldn't be doing it. There's a, if we, instead of asking God to remove all the problem people from your life, why don't change the way that you're praying? Start asking God to release his power to change you so that you can walk in peace and victory even when people fail or disappoint you. My prayer for today is, Lord, I realize today I've been praying the wrong way. I'm going to ask you to remove all the problems, problem people in my life. You've been wanting 
to reinforce me with sufficient strength to live with these people victoriously. Forgive me for wanting to run from my challenges. Help me face them bravely, confidently, in the power of the Holy Ghost. I know you want to give me this power, so open my heart to receive it now. now. Did you know when you were filled with the Holy Ghost, you had power? But did you know day to day, second by second, when that need arises, call out to him. He meets that need over and over again. I confess that God's grace, say this, I confess that God's grace is sufficient for me. When I feel distressed about how people act, I turn to the grace of God. I allow the Holy Spirit to fill me with dunamis power to love the unlovely, to be patient with those who act ugly, to walk in kindness and long-suffering with everyone I encounter. My weakness in dealing with people disappears when I yield to the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me. I declare this by faith in Jesus' name. Would you receive that from the pastor tonight? I wrote it for Deborah. Deborah's got the biggest problems in here. You know, I'm trying to get her straight, but, you know, do what I can. She thinks coffee can cure it all, but coffee can't cure it all. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to come tonight. Huh? It's our church. That's right. He said, when he, when he said, I'm going to be going to Branson, uh, do you mind coming and preaching? I used to do six services a week. I could do another service on Thursday. That's not Go have a great time. I want to go to Branson because I've never seen that Jesus down there. 